I'm taking out all the employees and starting my own company, Tom boasted to me as he returned from work. His announcement was so sudden I couldn't quite grasp what was happening. I stood there dumbstruck, not knowing how to respond. Tom, with a nasty smile, pulled out something to add insult to injury. Also, fill this out and submit it for me? That's what he laid before me, a completed divorce application. See you, he said, as he turned to leave. Wait a minute. My attempt to stop him was futile. Tom left, leaving me alone in the house. I stood frozen, still unable to comprehend the situation. But then a thought struck me. Perhaps they could help me out. I quickly grabbed my mobile phone and dialed their numbers. My name is Rola, 27 years old, single, working as an office clerk at a small lit company. Tired of the monotonous life, yet somehow finding comfort in it, I never took the initiative to change. Like anyone else, I harbored frustrations with work and relationships, often making them topics of conversation with colleagues and supervisors. But even I had a pressing concern that needed to be addressed. It was the fact that I couldn't find a boyfriend while friends and colleagues were getting married. I was living a life devoid of romantic encounters. The occasional message from a friend would often be about their marriage and, despite my desperation for a connection, I couldn't bring myself to genuinely congratulate them. Even when I wanted to take action, my feet wouldn't move. I thought maybe the right person would come along naturally. But after my closest colleague at work told me about her new boyfriend, I decided to seriously start looking. The first thing I tried was a dating app. I installed an app with relatively good reviews, set up my profile and photos, and started chatting with men. But I couldn't find a good match and ended up feeling defeated. Then I attended a few matchmaking parties, but couldn't find anyone to connect with. Even when I did match with someone, the relationship didn't last. On one hand, I was in a rush. On the other, I feared I might never get married. I decided that if I didn't meet someone nice at the next party, I would stop looking for a while. But at the next event, I met Tom, who would become my husband. Tom seemed like a kind man at first sight. His voice, his expression, everything about him was gentle, and he was a good conversationalist. What do you do for a living, Rolla? He asked. I'm in administration. Oh, really? That's impressive. I'm terrible with detailed work. I could never do office work. It was the first time someone had praised my job, and it made me feel unexpectedly happy. I tried to learn more about Tom, but I was quickly swept up in his charm. He kept complimenting me, and I wondered if it was just because he wanted to make a good impression. But I didn't mind being praised. I'm a simple person, after all. I found myself becoming more aware of Tom, wanting to talk more, and if possible, wanting more beyond that. That's how I began to feel. I guess Tom felt the same because we matched, and after the party, we decided to go out for drinks. I'm so happy to be talking with you like this, Rola, he said. Me too. The alcohol flowed, and the atmosphere was great. There was no longer an option for this to be a one-time thing. When shall we go out next? Let me check my schedule. We naturally made plans for next time and went our separate ways. After several more dates, Tom asked me to be his girlfriend. I had no reason to refuse and happily agreed. Two years later, Tom proposed. I was thrilled. Finally, I was getting married. I accepted his proposal and became Tom's wife. I was looking forward to a life with my beloved Tom. Just thinking about it made my heart swell with excitement. But little did I know I would later regret accepting Tom's proposal. We informed our families and had our wedding, and the busy time passed. Tom's parents were as kind and reliable as he was. Are your parents far away, Rola? Then you can't rely on them quickly if something happens. Yeah, that's true. 
When I mentioned my parents lived far away, they said, If you ever need help, talk to us. We'll do whatever we can to support you, they said. Tell us anything. Although I had gotten used to my parents being far away, it wasn't without its worries. I felt relieved and happy that my in-laws were supportive. With kind and reliable in-laws and my beloved Tom, I felt surrounded by wonderful people. A few weeks into our married life, it was just as happy as I had imagined with Tom. After quitting my job due to our marriage, I spent weekdays doing housework and waiting for Tom to come home. On weekends, we would go out together or relax by watching TV. Hey, I'm off tomorrow. Want to go somewhere? Um, let's go to the shopping mall. Great idea. Maybe we can stop by the bookstore nearby. Planning our future activities with Tom was enjoyable. We didn't have children. We had discussed it before marriage and ultimately decided not to have any. My age, physical strength, financial concerns, there were many reasons. But the main one was wanting to live a relaxed life, just the two of us. Seeing happy children in crowded places, like shopping malls or on social media, sometimes made me envious. But I always thought there was no happier life than the one I had with Tom, unchanged. Then one day, something Tom said changed my life significantly. I want to start a business. I wasn't too surprised, though, because Tom had mentioned it before we got married. I've been thinking about starting a business someday, a business. I was shocked when I first heard it and worried if it would be okay. Starting a business meant leaving his job eventually. Would it be okay in the long run? Would it work out? What if it failed? Many questions and concerns crossed my mind. Are you sure about this? Yeah, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I shared all my worries with Tom. Tom spoke with a sense of pride, sharing his company's plans, goals, and his aspirations for the future. He even showed me the documents he had prepared, revealing just how serious he was. It seemed he had thought everything through, and I believed he would succeed. Even if he didn't, I trusted Tom to handle it well. I decided to support Tom's dream. What do you think? It's a good time to start, right? We've saved up enough. If we're doing it, better sooner than later. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And so Tom began preparing for his business venture. I decided to use the time I had spent on my hobbies and rest to help with his startup. Everything was for Tom. Even my in-laws knew about his plans and came over to help us. Were you surprised when he said he wanted to start a business? He probably just blurted it out suddenly. I was surprised. But he explained his goals and plans well, so I thought it would be okay. Thank you for trusting our son. Lucy smiled kindly. Spending more time with my in-laws. I learned things about Tom and heard stories about their past I never knew. Apparently, they had run a business before. It wasn't a big company, just a small one with a few employees. Eventually, they had to close due to financial difficulties. But sharing this story with Tom sparked his interest in entrepreneurship. We told him it's tough and to forget about it, but he wouldn't listen. We said, if you can take responsibility, then go ahead and try. I had no idea. I hadn't expected such a backstory, but it felt typical of Tom to be inspired in this way. Two months later, after completing all the preparations and applications, the business finally started running smoothly. It was an SNS consulting firm. Since it was a world I knew nothing about, I left the main operations entirely to Tom. In return, though not exactly, I took on all the administrative tasks. My in-laws were probably concerned about their son's business. They would come to check on us and help out every few days. Many might find it unbelievable to see one's in-laws so frequently, but I was actually glad to have them around so much. They had become a significant support for me. Six months into the business, it began to stabilize, and we even started hiring part-timers. Still, my in-laws continued to help, 
making me feel somewhat guilty. So I talked about paying them, but they said, we're just free. Don't worry about it. I felt bad, but I stopped talking about payment, thinking they might not like money being mentioned too often. Before I knew it, a year had passed since we started the business. The performance was steadily good, and we expanded by increasing the number of employees and part-timers. The new employees were all kind, and I was happy to work in such a pleasant environment. I found my work more fulfilling than my previous job, enjoying it for the first time. Everything seemed to be going well, but there was one thing that had taken a turn for the worst, Tom's behavior. Are you skipping work again today? Yeah, sorry, I have something to do. Okay, understood. Tom started missing work, claiming he was unwell or had errands. While it's understandable to be sick or have errands once or twice, it becomes questionable when it happens several times. What could be so important that he needs to miss work for it, especially when work-related tasks are usually handled during work hours? The more I thought about it, the more I wondered what Tom was doing so secretively. Rola, I might be late or unable to come to work tomorrow because of some errands. Sorry again. Tomorrow, although he apologized, it felt insincere. If he truly felt sorry, I thought he might try to improve his behavior. One day, I decided to gently point out Tom's excessive absences. Tom, I know it's your company, but it's still work. I'd really appreciate it if you could handle personal matters on your days off. Tom seems surprised by my words. Sorry, I'll be more careful. Thank you. After my talk, Tom started coming to work regularly again. I was relieved to see him taking my advice seriously. However, within a month, Tom began skipping work again, using excuses like errands or feeling ill. I realized that if I was the only one to address it, Tom wouldn't take it so seriously. So I decided to talk to my in-laws. I need to talk about Tom. I approached my in-laws when they were helping out. They were shocked when they heard. Tom has been doing that. We thought he was busy with work outside. We had no idea he was skipping work. Indeed, it's work after all. I understand if he's unwell or has personal matters, but it seems like he's taking too many days off. As I explained Tom's recent behavior, my in-laws became visibly upset. The next day, my in-laws called Tom for a talk. Tom, we heard you've been missing work lately. Why did you? We heard it from Rola. What are you doing, really? Remember, this is the business you started. Don't rely too much on others and take responsibility. We don't want to say this, but don't end up closing down like we did, regretting it later. Tom seemed shocked to be called out by his parents and was somewhat distracted. Are you listening? Yeah, sorry. I am really stop causing trouble for others. If you have genuine reasons, explain them in detail. Understand. Mike's stern words seemed to annoy Tom as he reluctantly accepted them. I had never seen Tom like this before. Puzzled, I looked at him. Tom asked me irritably, What? Sorry, it's nothing, I replied quickly. Okay, Tom muttered before leaving the room. Even my in-laws had never seen Tom act this way and were whispering to each other. Maybe he was just tired. Lately, Tom had been taking days off work, saying he had errands and always returning home late at night. I was curious about what these errands were, but every time I tried to ask, he evaded the question. What was he hiding from me? That night, feeling a bit guilty for pressing the issue, I decided to ask Tom directly. Hey, what's been going on lately? You take days off for errands and always come back late. Are you hiding something? We're married. You don't need to hide things for me. I thought, given everything, he would talk to me honestly. However, Tom glared at me sharply and said, Rola, 
It's none of your business. I don't need to tell you. But it doesn't concern you. If I say it doesn't, the discussion is over. Got it. Wait just a minute. I'll stop slacking off at work. That should be enough, right? Stop nagging, he interrupted, then left me standing there. Nagging, huh? His words hurt me deeply. It was the first time Tom had spoken to me so harshly. In shock, I thought maybe I should have just observed a little longer. Yet, I also felt he needed to be responsible for his work. But if I pointed it out again, he would probably call me nagging. I was at a loss about how to interact with Tom. Since the day my in-laws talked to him, Tom's attitude toward me had changed drastically. He began showing up for work without any more excuses, but started looking at me with disgust. He would ignore me when I spoke to him, and even in private, he seemed irritated by my presence. Hey, Tom, about today's work? Don't ignore me. Did I do something wrong? Nothing in particular, he replied dismissively. What was Tom thinking? Had he started to dislike me? No matter how much I pondered, I couldn't find an answer. But what was it that Tom was hiding? What he thought about the day when I would find out everything was coming. Usually, Tom didn't work overtime and came home early. That day he seemed happy, almost relieved. That was the expression on his face when I got home from work. Tom was unusually sitting on the living room sofa. That's rare, I said, surprised. Then Tom turned to me with a nasty smile and confidently announced, I'm taking all the employees and starting my own company. I didn't understand what he was saying, but Tom, amused by my shock, continued, Oh, and write this too. He pulled out a completed divorce application. I've got a new woman, so write this. Wait, what do you mean? It means exactly what I said. She's so much better than you. Really glad I met her. I couldn't comprehend what was being said. Starting his own company. Divorce. Everything was happening too fast. I'll then make sure to submit that divorce application. See you. Ignoring my dazed state, Tom left the house. I was left alone in the silent room. In front of me was the completed divorce application. The suddenness of everything made it hard for me to process. What should I do? What's the right course of action now? I couldn't find an answer. But then I thought of someone who might help, my in-laws. They hadn't come to the office today, but they should be at home. Shaking, I took out my mobile phone and called them. Hello. Lucy's gentle voice came through, hearing her voice. I felt a wave of relief and began to cry. What? What's wrong? Well, Tom, I managed to tell Lucy about everything Tom had said in my current situation. I don't know what to do. Just wait a moment, please, Mike. Lucy sounded panicked and went to consult with Mike. Soon she came back on the line. Wait at home for us. Mike and I will come over. We should talk face to face. Is that okay? Yes, of course. We'll be there soon. A few minutes later, my in-laws arrived. Lucy, Mike, are you okay? Rola, I'm okay. But seeing them, I broke down in tears. I hated feeling so pathetic in such a situation. My in-laws quickly supported me and brought me to the living room. After a few minutes, I calmed down and explained everything in more detail. Tom was cheating. He often came home late on days he said he had errands. He left suddenly after telling me to file the divorce application. And he said he was taking all the employees to start his own business. I couldn't believe what was happening and my words faltered. My in-laws listened attentively, nodding in understanding. But after I finished, they looked stunned and were at a loss for words. Then Mike said, I'm really sorry. Her son Lucy also apologized. It's not something you two should apologize for. My in-laws apologized to me. Seeing the scene, 
I felt unbearably uneasy. I was relieved to have talked to them, given everything they would be on my side. But I didn't know what to do next. I needed to find out if Tom had approached all the employees about leaving where he was now and get proof of his affair. After his harsh behavior and being confronted with the divorce papers, I couldn't even consider reconciliation. Since Tom wanted a divorce, of course, I decided to go through with it regardless of how things unfolded. Naturally, I wanted to ensure Tom was held accountable and get compensation. What should I do? As I murmured, Mike, sitting in front of me, spoke up. Let's solve this one step at a time. We'll look into Tom's situation, Rolla. Please take care of the company. If he's talking about starting a business that hasn't caused any commotion, it's likely just talk. Understood. So I decided to split up tasks with my in-laws. I absolutely won't forgive him if he says it was all just a joke after all this nonsense. When Tom announced the divorce and his intention to start his own company, I was overwhelmed by confusion and unclear emotions. But now it's different. I harbored clear hatred for Tom and began preparing to bring him down. A month later, Tom was in front of me. I had gathered as much evidence and testimony as possible and called Tom to my in-law's house. Initially, Tom continued his harsh words. But when I mentioned I would submit the divorce papers if he showed up, he suddenly changed his attitude and agreed. The thought of him showing up without knowing what was going to happen amused me. What do you want? I came because I was called. I have nothing to say. Where had the Tom from before starting his business gone? It felt like a bad dream. So, so you've been doing whatever you like, huh? Doing whatever I like. What do you mean? Tom crossed his legs and taunted. I would have been confused and speechless before, but not now. Having an affair, trying to start your own company on your own, huh? I said that, didn't I? Huh? You mean that by doing whatever I like, among other things, like stealing money and supplies. I knew about the affair and his plans to leave the company, but as I investigated, I found out Tom had been stealing company money. When I brought up the money, Tom's face changed and he began to panic visibly. Huh? Why would I need to do that? Are you crazy? Do you have any proof? You're not making up lies to frame me, are you? You think I'm lying now? Let me tell you it's not because I want to divorce you. I am divorcing you. That's why I called you here today. Then show me the proof, Tom said, sounding panicked. So I showed him the surveillance video as he requested. What cameras? Why? You weren't coming to the company for a while, remember? I installed them. Then I thought I consulted you about it, but you weren't listening. Actually, I had wanted to enhance security, especially around the safe. So I proposed installing surveillance cameras. I couldn't install the cameras on my own, so I consulted with Tom. He seemed distracted when he said, Oh, that should be fine, but there's no doubt he agreed. So I installed the security cameras with the employee's consultation. The question was, how did we find out Tom was stealing money? Simply saying we saw it on the cameras was one thing, but there was testimony from an employee who saw suspicious behavior. This employee, an older part-timer, was not approached by Tom about joining his new venture, unlike other employees. You've been telling various people to come with you to the new company, promising better conditions. Everyone refused, though. But to have a tip-off from the only part-timer you didn't approach? Is this some kind of joke? What did you say? I showed the angry Tom the surveillance footage specially accompanied by my commentary. See, you're stealing money here, right? Look. Unable to deny the evidence on the video, Tom hung his head. What were you going to use it for? Startup funds. He was stealing from the company to fund his own venture. What? That's unbelievable. 
I had no choice, no choice. Just continue the business as it was. But nothing explains why you did it. Mike had been silent until now, but probably frustrated with Tom's evasiveness. He finally spoke up. Then Tom, trembling, began to explain why he wanted to start a business. It turned out to be because of his affair partner. Tom had met her at a bar after work. She was consulting people who wanted to start their own businesses like Tom. As their relationship progressed, he began thinking about starting a new venture with her. It was harder than I thought to start a business. So why did you suddenly decide to start a new business? It all seems very suspicious. I thought it would work out with that woman. His patheticness was overwhelming. A person who gives up so easily wouldn't succeed in a new venture. And he was a man who would steal money for his independence. He could cause even bigger problems in the future. You're incredibly selfish. Were you with your mistress when you said you had errands and didn't come to work? Yes. At this point, I just wanted to get compensation and get rid of him. My in-laws seemed more disgusted than angry about the compensation for the affair. As soon as I started talking about compensation, Tom, who had been hanging his head, suddenly looked up at me and said something. Too late. Hey, Rolla, can we start over? I'll break up with her. I'll give up on the business idea. Let's start from scratch, just the two of us. Seriously, he suggested starting over, is he sane? As I stood there in shock, Tom continued, Come on, it'll be fine, right? I was stupid to talk about divorce. Let's go places together again, make happy memories. So no way. But Mike, angered by Tom's words, slammed the evidence of the affair on the table. How can you even think of starting over after doing something like this? This is. Mike had laid out documents and photos from the detective agency that had investigated Tom and his mistress. Photos of Tom and his mistress entering a hotel, walking arm in arm, looking happy. Detailed documents about what Tom and his mistress had been doing and where. There was no escaping it now. Why are there photos like this? A detective agency. Yes, I needed solid evidence for the compensation. If we divorce, you could retract your admission of the affair at any time. So it's better to have solid proof from a detective agency, right? Why is your dad, mom, and R all against me? Who would side with someone who does such despicable things? I'm disappointed in you. You only suggested starting over because you don't want to pay compensation. You're a disgraceful son. I was truly grateful that my in-laws were reasonable people. Realizing that they wouldn't take his side, Tom slumped again. Whatever you do, my feelings for you won't return. After I made it clear there was no chance of reconciliation, Tom had nothing more to say. Later, through a lawyer, I demanded compensation from Tom and his mistress. The lawyer said they were resistant to paying at first, but eventually they had no choice but to agree. It's unthinkable they would resist at this stage. They had appeared resigned at the meeting, but their true nature was disappointing. A week after the divorce was finalized, Tom sent me a ridiculous message saying, You made me break up with her. What are you going to do about it? I wondered what he expects me to do. I ignored him, but he kept sending messages persistently. So, when I replied that he was being annoying, he finally stopped. I haven't heard from him since, but the compensation continues to be paid. So he must be managing somehow. Later, I heard from my in-laws that they had cut ties with Tom, too. Now it's strange. From his parents, his wife, and his mistress, Tom must be alone. I hope he uses this opportunity to reflect on how awful his actions have been. Now I'm running the company that Tom and I started, serving as its representative. But, to be honest, I'm just a representative in name. In reality, I rely heavily on the help of those around me. Even so, 
It's comforting and reassuring to know that the employees believe in me and follow my lead. My former in-laws, now strangers, occasionally check on me because they're worried. How am I surrounded by such warm people? I continue my efforts to expand the business, grateful for my environment.